And we have been talking about applying for tags, talk about digital scouting, learning the resource, which is learning the land, the access points, the trails, the public, the pri private. We talked about long range scouting, finding animals, uh, breaking down animal behavior. We've been covering a lot over the last couple months. Uh, and again, tonight is all about wrapping that up. So we want to hear from you right now. Give me a thumbs up. Give me questions. Where are you at? Do you feel confident in the terrain that you're hunting? Are you confident in the tag that you have? So obviously we had our primary draw, we then had our secondary draw, all the results are out from that secondary draw. So by now, you should have a fairly good concept of what tag you are hunting on. As far as future opportunity to tags go, there's a handful of things still coming up. So on August 3rd at 9 a.m. is when our leftover list comes out, or what, excuse me, when our leftover licenses are available, the list will come out just before that. Uh, so there is still opportunity at the leftover license available. And you always have, uh, in, in elk regards, your OTC, which is over-the-counter units uh, in Colorado. It's going to offer great opportunity for archery, second, and third rifle hunts. So a lot of tags still available. Uh, so again, if you do not have one yet, you can still purchase those uh, and have those, those options ahead of you. But make sure that you start planning now. Plan what tag you're going to have. Hopefully you already have one, but if not, grab one of those future tags and start scouting. Get caught up on all those things that you want. Because uh, again, the more education you have now, I promise you, the more successful you will be this coming fall. Uh, I am shooting my rifles. I have found animals. I have found patterns. And honestly, I already have some, some pretty good patterns uh, on both elk, deer, and bears. Uh, you know, it's hard to say how long they last, but generally speaking, the patterns that these animals are in now are almost always fall into the fall. Uh, so I'm excited about it. The patterns of the animals that I'm watching right now are, are very reliable, so I'm excited about it. But what questions do you have? We're gonna start jumping into things right now. Bring your questions, share the post, uh, and let's get to it. Let's make everybody a more successful hunter. So what do we have with us? Thanks, Nate. Our first question is, are you allowed to use calls to hunt bear in Colorado? Absolutely. So the, the question, I'm gonna just kind of reiterate, can you call bears in Colorado? now? Honestly, absolutely. So there's a couple of things with that. Bear hunting is one of those things that is a great opportunity here in Colorado. Uh, we have a growing bear population and Colorado Parks and Wildlife has done a great job of making it easy to acquire these bear tags. So in the past we were you know, very much drawing these tags, but now a lot of times you can accompany other big game licenses with bear tags. So there's a lot of opportunities to, to have a bear tag here in Colorado. Uh, you have a long September season. Uh, then you you have individual week-long seasons with your general hunting tag. So a lot of opportunities for bear. Uh, now in Colorado, we are hunting them strictly in the fall. So other places in other country or other states, you can use various techniques different times of years to hunt bears. In Colorado, we're very much spot and stocks, hunting on water holes. But one of the things that's probably most overlooked is calling to bear. So I'm glad you brought that question up. Uh, it is very successful. So the, the breaking down calling bears, there's a couple of things that you have to know. Number one, uh, when you are around the right bear and you are using the right call, um, it's actually fairly easy. These bears come in very quick. Um, the biggest thing is being near bears. I think so many hunters that try to call bears, you know, will, will go to a general area. They hope there's bears in the area. They call, they don't have success, and they give up. Generally speaking, it's not that the bear didn't want to come into the call. It's usually that there's not a bear around. If a bear's around and you are within that vocal distance, a lot of times they come running. The ideal situation uh, with the ultimate bear hunt um, is to use a cub in distress or a cub squall. So you are actually imitating being a very immature bear and a boar will come running in. So the ideal situation, you're gonna use a cub squall uh, is kind of the, the, the sound that you're making with a hand call. Um, and you, those if those boars are in the area, it will shock you how successful they will come in. Um, honestly, the first couple bears that I ever called into my life um, like threw me off. I was not ready. I've done a lot of coyotes, uh, you know, turkey, elk, and you know, these birds and, and these other animals, they kind of let you know, you hear them come in, you have time to set up, and, and all of a sudden in the bear regards, 
I mean, they are flat out running at you. The the first two bears I ever called in, I was not ready with my shooting sticks. I did not have my firearm ready. They came in quicker than I was anticipating. So in regards to bear hunting, uh, make sure there's bears in the area. Get to the areas where they're going to be. Think about where they are at the time that you're calling. Uh, you know, they, they love hanging out in those big rocky cliffs, that dark timber. So go to those type areas, dark, damp, rough country. Uh, make sure they can hear the call. Make sure your wind is right. Think about where they're approaching. That approaches everything. Don't let them smell you because their nose is everything in regards to bears. So make sure your wind is correct. Make sure they can hear the call. I always start with that cub squall uh, just because it's so successful. If the cub squall doesn't work, I'll almost always move into like a rabbit in distress, your typical predator call, and both boars and sows will come into that. And lastly, probably one of the most overlooked bear calls is crows. Uh, you do feeding crows. You do like uh, crows are having a heyday, like they found a, a carcass. Uh, you do a lot of bird calls calls uh, and those bears will almost always come into that so question of the day on that calling bears absolutely very successful uh, just make sure you get yourself in the right situation take those tips and uh, I promise you it will work so and enjoyable be ready it happens faster than you think it will so I'm excited about the number of questions coming in but I'm gonna keep on the ca the call that train here do you normally throw out a cow call or bugle when hiking hiking into a scouted spot and about how far in do you throw out your first bugle absolutely so so the call is when and, and how to call especially in that elk season when you're, you're making that approach so number one uh, I kind of look at the general situation so I think so many hunters can somewhat over pressure bulls with loud aggressive bugles so number one through scouting I'm hoping to know what kind of bulls I'm dealing with so I hope that I scout enough to where I know hey the bull that I'm approaching or the, that general bulls that I'm approaching you know maybe aren't the most aggressive maybe they're not the biggest herd bull in the area so that's a bull that I'm almost always going to lead with a cow call because if I come in too strong too hot uh, those bulls might be like hey I don't really want to fight today. I'm not willing to lose my cows uh, this early in the season. So if you get too aggressive on the wrong bull, you're really going to hurt your odds. Uh, but if you know you're going into a situation where you have a herd bull, he has a harem, uh, that's a bull that is going to take on that challenge, and that's where that bugle is going to be more successful. But I would say literally, you know, being a, a fly on my shoulder walking in the woods, I would say nine times out of ten, I always start off with a cow call. Uh, it's just that good, starting point of a conversation start off with that cow call kind of listen um, hopefully get a response if not then lead into the bugle but I would say nine times out of ten I start with that cow call and I slowly work my way into that conversation because uh, number one it gives off their their kind of idea of where they're at uh, and two it doesn't necessarily immediately make them come in uh, a lot of times I'm doing calls before it actually gets light so I'll be approaching my hunting situation early in the morning and I want to locate the animals but I do not want them to come in so I want to locate them, then get my wind right, get my approach right, figure out where I'm going to set up on these animals. But if I do too aggressive of a bugle, say an hour before light, there's times where that bull will want to come into me, um, and I'm obviously not ready. It's so much easier to call them in in the dark because they have confidence, um, and that's not what you want. So those subtle cow calls, uh, again, are just always going to be a safer bet. Not to say I don't immediately lead into a bugle, but always start with those cow calls. It'll help you out in the end. So I've seen a couple questions around this, so I'm going to shift gears just yep. a little bit. Um, people have scouted their units several times. They're not finding animals, so do you have suggestions? And then a um, few folks have been in mornings and evenings not seeing too much activity. Yep. When do you suggest them moving to areas? So just not seeing a whole lot, yeah. so when sh when should they move? Absolutely. I mean, number one, I would say just make sure that you are in there in the key light periods. Now, it, this is the hardest part about summer scouting because it does. It gets light early. So, you know, generally speaking, even in the worst case scenario, I would say that your animal should be on their feet for at least 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening. Now, I have some animals that have literally been staying out until 9 o'clock in the morning, so I have hours to scout these animals. But I have a, a group of bulls that's only been staying out for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, you know, so literally by 6 a.m., these animals are retreating to the dark timber. Right? You know, I can start seeing them at that 6, or excuse me, 520, 525. I'm making visual confirmation. Uh, you know, by 6, 610, 615, these animals are already going in the woods. So if you're 
you're not seeing anything, number one, just make sure that you're in the woods at the right time. So if for anybody that is getting in the woods, maybe that seven o'clock, eight o'clock, you might just be missing the animals. If you're in the woods uh, in the afternoon at three, four o'clock, but you're already hiking out, uh, you know, when it's starting still very much light, you might just be missing them. Uh, so number one, make sure you're there for literally the first 45 minutes of light. You're not hiking in, you are in position, you are glassing, you are where the animal should be for that first 45 minutes and that last 45 minutes. That's the first piece of advice. Uh, number two, if you flat out are not seeing animals, uh, it's time to move. Your animals are where they are going to be during hunting season right now. Um, they're not going to show up. They're not going to move. Um, you know, we might see some migrations during the rut, um, but those animals are there now. So regardless, you need to be on animals by now. That is a major point of our scouting. So if you are not seeing them, start to make major changes. Now with that, uh, it kind of falls back to that food, water, bedding. So the areas that you're looking for them, make sure that you have that green grass. Make sure you have adequate dark timber, you know, kind of just again, that rougher sanctuary area for their bedding grounds. Make sure you have water, whether that's a water hole, a creek, um, make sure that you have those three things. Sometimes you might have two of the three, but that might not be adequate for them. So they're going to migrate on. So make sure you're on that food, water, bedding. And if you're not seeing animals, start to move um, and make changes. I mean, whether you make a small move or a drastic move, uh, you definitely want to be on animals now. So check your light, make sure you are there in those key periods. Uh, make sure you're not getting winded before those of you would actually see those animals. So just kind of think about that. Make sure you're not spooking them. Uh, and if you're not seeing them, double check the food, water, bedding, but make drastic moves. Start covering serious ground uh, until you find them. Now, if you do run out of time, I've had a lot of hunters say to say, hey, you know, I, I, I'm I scouting an area that's two, three hours from my house. Uh, I have 45 minutes in the morning, 45 in the afternoon. What do I do the rest of the day? Um, as long as I'm not hurting myself. So if it's a situation to where I know my wind is good. I know the animals are bedding over here, but I want to check other ground. As long as you do not get wind, as long as you do not interfere with the animal's daily behavior, you can hike around and look for scat. Look for areas where they've been feeding. Check water holes or creeks where they have been drinking. I had a situation the other day where I was, I had the animals, I had physically seeing the animals. I was struggling to figure out where they were drinking midday. I had a great situation where they were drinking at night, but I couldn't figure out where they were drinking during the day. So I actually hiked out like a three mile creek, uh, just looking for, for tracks going into this creek. Uh, so that's another solution. So if you're not finding animals, uh, again, we don't want to just walk around. You're definitely not going into the bedding grounds. You're not going into the dark timber because you're going to spook your animals and you're going to wreck your scouting. Um, but you can go to the areas where they're not in. So if they're feeding during the day, obviously, or feeding in those low light periods, at noon, they're going to be in their bedding grounds. So you can go look for their feeding areas look for tracks, look for scat, start finding that. Once you start seeing that, you know you're getting closer, then find the animals and kind of start breaking it down. But the moral of the story, you should be on animals now. They're not gonna magically show up. So, so make major changes to find those animals. So you talked about food, water, and bedding. You've mentioned it in the scouting videos. Can you give some ideas of what potentially animals may be feeding on above 10,000 feet? Absolutely. So, so the biggest thing there is grass. Um, it is almost 100% grass right now. So we will see what we call, you know, that, that high plains kind of kind of brush. Uh, a lot of times we call it moose marsh. But that, that smaller scrub uh, bush that you get above tree line, you usually don't see those animals making a change to that food source until October. So from right now until we lead up all the way up into September, I would say majority of the food for the elk and deer is all going to be high country grass. We don't see them moving to shrubs, trees, uh, anything else to gain leaves or, or for, foliage off of uh, until at least October. So right now it is all grass. So when I'm up there looking for it, I'm looking for that for that taller grass. Um, and you're going to definitely see changes of grass on different sides of the mountain. Obviously, your, your south facing slopes are going to have a lot more sun. Uh, and depending on how much rain you're getting, that can even dry up. Up, uh, or, or have lacking growth. In the spring, that sun makes that grass bloom faster. Uh, but by now, on some hot days, you might see that grass starting to wilt a little bit. Uh, so a lot of times you might have to make a small transition to, to the western face, uh, the east face, the north face, uh, to find different grass that those animals are liking. Uh, so I definitely put a, a directional phase on those tree line hunts up there. Uh, but it, it pretty much is exclusively grass. You're not going to see it switch to that, that more bush fashion uh, until you start getting into October. So it's all about the grass right now. 
So Nate, if you had to choose, if you had your choice between morning hunt or late afternoon, evening hunt, is there one that you prefer more or have been more successful at? So the, the biggest thing, is it, it's kind of two part and twofold on the general situation. In a scouting situation, uh, I am putting a lot more emphasis on my morning scouting uh, for, for two reasons. Uh, the number one reason for that is when I first see them in the morning, it generally leads to where I watch them go to their beds um, and then I know exactly where they are. So if I want to scout around to learn access points in and out of my hunting areas, uh, if I want to scout around trying to find water holes, I know exactly where the animals are so I can move around, adjust my wind, and I can still gain information uh, throughout the course of the day. In the evening, once you see those animals drop into dark timber, like you think they're right there, um, but by that afternoon, you don't quite know where they're at. Until they pop out, you're not exactly sure where they're at. So the afternoon, I'm a lot more limited at what I can do in a scouting fashion uh, because I don't know exactly pinpoint where they're at. So the afternoon, I'm kind of just sitting there waiting to strictly see animals. Uh, they pop out. I gain some information on the animals. It's good. But the morning, I know exactly where they're at. I can play my win, and I just have a lot more maneuverability uh, to, to gain more education in the morning. So I'm doing more scouting in the morning than they are in the afternoon. Now, in an elk hunting situation, in a rut situation, uh, even deer and bears, I will say that looking at my success rate from the past, you know, 25 years of hunting big game here in Colorado or 30 years, um, I have had a lot more success in the afternoon. Uh, in a rut situation for elk, for example, these animals are breeding all night long. So they're running all night long in the morning all they want to do is bed down. So that bull wants to round up that harem of cows and put them to bed. So the morning, even though they're very vocal, your odds of pulling that bull to you are slim. They're tired. They've been breeding all day. All of a sudden, the afternoon comes around. They just took a you know three, four, six, eight hour nap, um, and the breeding period starts in that that you know early evening and goes all night long. So in a rut situation for elk, when you approach an afternoon hunt or an evening hunt. The bulls are, I mean, 10 times more callable because it's natural for them. They know the breeding period is starting for them at that point in time of the day. Uh, so when you approach the same bull morning versus afternoon, your odds of pulling that bull to you are drastically better in the afternoon. Same type thing almost with any animal. So let's just talk deer, for example. Um, so often I go out in the morning and I watch that animal bed, whether it's you know, in high country, we just talked about where they drop into a, just a big section of, of you know, that, that kind of high alpine scrub bush, um, or they drop into dark timber or wherever they go. I can watch them go into that timber and then I can tell myself, I know they're right there bedded. So I know from scouting, my afternoon wind is going to, you know, switch or blow whatever direction at a certain time. So I can put myself in the ideal situation to where when that animal gets up out of the bedding area, I'm going to be right on top of it. I'm going to make a successful harvest. Whereas the morning, I'm always rushed. You know, it's first light, you're trying to find them, then you find them. And all that animal is doing is getting ready to go to bed and you're rushed to get in that situation to make the perfect opportunity opportunity as opposed to in the afternoon just let them do their thing in the morning and just watch them pinpoint which trail they're walking on where they're walking what tree do they walk by and where they bed and then it just gives you the exact location where the afternoon you can set yourself up for a better more successful hunt and you have less risk of things going wrong so again scouting i'm more morning success wise i've done a lot better in the afternoon because i have more uh, more education to, to create that success Got another scouting question for you. How do you determine where elk are via digital scouting when boots on the ground scouting isn't as feasible? Absolutely. So, I mean, the biggest thing with the digital scouting, uh, and you have a lot of opportunities for this, but number one, you're really seeking out what we call the daily migrations or the daily patterns that we've talked about. And honestly, with that, I was trying to throw out there on YouTube, we have a playlist of all this stuff. So everything we've done live, edited, uh, we have available on the Colorado Parks and Life uh, YouTube channel. So just go down the playlist. You can always rewatch that stuff. But in the digital fashion, you are always looking for water, food, and bed. And, and those animals, are going to find those migrations. They're going to stick to it because they're going to repeat themselves every day. So in the digital fashion, you're putting a major influence on that. Now, in the coming month or so, we're going to talk about trail cameras and obtaining and getting information when you can't be in the field. Uh, so in regards to a digital scouting situation, if my hunting area is a long ways away and I can't put boots on the ground uh, as often as I would like, I'm going to do everything I can when I when I get into that situation. So I'm going to digital scout everything. I am literally 
literally to the point to where I'm on, you know, my device and I'm setting trails on my maps. I'm doing everything I can to where I have zero waste of time when I do get into the field. Uh, when I do get in the field, I'm going to set trail cameras, um, not necessarily even looking for animals, but looking for patterns. When do they drink? When do they eat? When do they bed? Which direction are they watching or walking? You know, what's my wind doing? Um, all that kind of stuff. I also, uh, during a scouting process, if I have very limited time, I do everything I can to work with the, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife field officers when I can. If you're going to a, a, a region or a big game unit that's far from home, you know, try to figure out who the manager or who's working in that, that field uh, and make a quick call. Shoot an email. Hey, you know, I'm really excited to hunt this unit. Uh, do you have any advice? You know, what have you been seeing? How's the animals looking? Uh, and and all the, everybody's out there happy to work with you and, and give you some information. So do everything you can to gain all of the information that you physically can without being there. When you get there, have a plan to make the most of, of that when you do get there. And again, that's where trail cameras do start to come in handy. One more scouting question for you. Long ring scouting, how close is too close and how far is too far? <laughs> that, that's a great question. We get that a lot. I actually had that question four or five times uh, after that last long range video came out. Uh, the biggest goal is to not interrupt these animals whatsoever. Um, obviously, everything we preach, you get the gist of it. Scouting is everything. Having information going into a hunt is just what makes you more successful. So again, we're not saying you have to dedicate to it, uh, but the scout I promise will be the biggest thing that will take you to the next level in your success rate of big game hunting here in Colorado. Uh, so with that being said, you don't want to mess things up. I know so many people that do so much scouting, they have all this great information, and then one day they get too excited, and they go a little too close, and you know they blow out the whole herd, uh, and you interrupt the pattern. They usually fall back into it, uh, but it might take a little bit. It might take a couple days. It might take a month. Um, so you just don't want to be that situation of causing harm. You don't want to get winded. You don't want to get seen. Uh, you don't want to leave that trace. Uh, you're not going there camping or having campfires or leaving food or, or anything like that. So as far as what's too close, uh, you should be able to go out there, uh, do your thing and be 100% undetected. So to the point where I'm scouting, I am available to make these videos like you watched. I should be able to talk to my phone, uh, talk to my hunting partner, uh, all that kind of stuff, have some movement without these animals ever detecting me. So I am far enough away to where at no point are they gonna know I am there. And the biggest thing with that is coming in and out. That's the other big thing that I think as far as coming too close or too far. I know so many hunters that get in this great spot they're watching these animals, and then all of a sudden the animal comes over here to bed, and their wind's going there, and they're like, how do I get out of here? How do I get back to my, my truck? Or how do I get back to the trail without getting winded, without getting seen? And they put themselves in a bad situation. So with that, I'm always going to areas and having a plan to where I can get in and out undetected. As far as what's too far, uh, that's going to come up to you. Uh, I mean, I'm running big spotting scopes. Uh, you can see that that right there. I have an 80 power, so it's 27 by 80 or 20 by 60 by 85. Um, I have you know a lot of power behind my glass. I can see that it's an animal literally five, six, seven miles away. Uh, when I want to start talking maturity to where I'm, you know, I'm looking at bulls and bucks and bears, and I want to see if uh, you know if it's a boar versus sow, a big bull versus a little bull, um, all that kind of stuff. Obviously, you have to get a little closer, but in reality, uh, the sky's the limit. I don't think there's anything too far because you're always going to build information. We talked earlier had that question about not finding animals. That's when literally I would climb to the tallest mountain I could possibly find in that unit. I'd sit behind my spotting scope and I am looking long range. I mean, I might be 10 miles where I can be like, hey, there's 20 dots over there. I know they're elk. I don't have a clue if they're bulls, cows, but at least I found animals, so I had a place to start on my next scouting trip. Um, so too far, uh, as long as you can make out what kind of animal it is, a deer versus an elk, uh, I think that's about your distance there. So, so nothing's too far, but there's definitely things that are too close. So just make sure you are never detected. Uh, leave that resource. Let them continue to build their patterns. It's going to create more success for you. I've got several questions about ammunition. So maybe we can just combine them all and you can talk a little yeah. bit about um, specifically what type of ammunition for bears 
And then um, what green bullet do you suggest? So maybe breaking it down yeah. by species for us. Absolutely. So, I mean, in regards, we actually get a lot of questions on this. And obviously of all years, uh, last year going into the 2020 hunting season, uh, you know, we didn't have a ton of ammo out there and these questions started coming up. Uh, I can't say that that situation has gotten any better. Uh, we are very limited on the availability of ammunition, brands, uh, all that kind of stuff that you're shooting. So we will kind of break it down for you. Now, in regards to that, you kind of have have mid-grade, you have high and you low. So no matter what caliber you're shooting, obviously always make sure that it is, you know, reaching the requirements set forth by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So there's going to be caliber restrictions and, and grains and all that, uh, depending on it. But generally speaking, your big game is going to be a 24 caliber or larger uh, with muzzle loaders, uh, you know, your 45 caliber on deer, 50 caliber on elk. Uh, so just make sure you grab that big game book or just download that process on the website. Uh, you can just search, you know, Colorado big game brochure and all all that information is going to be there. So just make sure you're within legal requirements. But as far as a heavy bullet versus a light bullet, that's probably one of my favorite questions. Um, the, the good and the bad, if you shoot a lighter grain bullet, so let's just say uh, in regards to shooting a 30 caliber rifle, so whether it's a 30 at six or a 300 win or, or any of these, um, you, know, you might have bullets as light as 165 and as heavy as 200 or 210. Um, so that's a very wide range of grain bullets that you can shoot. And the, the good and the bad, if you shoot a lighter grain bullet, you get drastically less drop. So as you're shooting, um, that bullet is going to have a lot less fall, um, so you can be off on your yardage. So when you're judging how far away that animal is, a lighter bullet has less drop, uh, and that's a big thing where you're not going to miss your target because you have less drop. However, uh, when you shoot a lighter bullet, it is a lot easier, uh, you know, basically, you know, change direction due to wind, due to hitting a piece of grass, uh, even upon contact to that animal, a really light bullet, you could hit a rib and you could get, you know, basically a direction change. By hitting a shoulder, you could get a direction change. Uh, so a lot of things can change the, the, the direction that that lighter bullet will fly. Opposed to a heavier bullet, you're gonna have a lot more drop compensation. So, you know, a 165 versus 200 grain bullet, um, you know, at, at 200 yards, you're gonna get, you know, inches of fall on the 200 grain that you wouldn't get on the 165, but that larger, heavier bullet, uh, it's gonna fly through wind a lot better. It's gonna fly through rain, snow a lot better. If you happen to hit you know, a couple blades of grass, uh, it's gonna do a lot better. And the biggest thing, upon contact on that animal, whether it hits a rib, a shoulder blade, the heavier grain bullets is gonna continue the direction that it's flying, um, and it's gonna do a little better. So a personal opinion, I tend to shoot heavier than lighter at the end of the day it's gonna do a lot better for you in adverse conditions now I think we all want that ideal day we always want it to be no wind calm uh, you know nice weather but let's face it we're, we're hunting uh, we take the opportunities when we are uh, you know positioned with them so so again I tend to shoot that heavier bullet now after I said a whole spiel this is the true truth of the matter Accuracy is everything. So selecting the right caliber rifle for you, selecting the right bullet, you have to shoot good with your method of take. And that's everything. That's with archery equipment, that's with muzzle loaders, and that's with your rifle. So you hitting your target where you say, I'm gonna shoot that grain of hair, that is priority. Whether it's a light bullet, a heavy bullet, uh, a smaller caliber or a larger caliber, um, you have to make sure that you are accurate with that firearm. And that is the most crucial thing. I would rather you see or uh, go on a hunt for a moose or a bear with a lighter caliber that you can hit accurate with than say, oh, I'm going on a bear hunt. I need to get a 338 or a 375 and be so scared of the recoil that you're not accurate with it. So again, end of the day, accuracy is everything. If you're more accurate with the drop compensation of a lighter caliber, lighter bullet, that will be more priority uh, than anything. So hitting accurately, number one. And the reason we talk about this, buy ammo, buy the same ammo, and start shooting as frequently as you can, whether that's time uh, or availability of ammunition, but you definitely want to get to the range and you want to shoot. Uh, I will say this, not to say to go out and spend a bunch of money, but when I do buy ammunition, I buy a, a two, three, four boxes of that ammunition. Uh, I want to make sure that I can practice and I can hunt with the same thing. I was actually at a local retailer this morning and I saw a gentleman buying two or three brands of ammo. He's like, I want to see what shoots best in my rifle. 
rifle. Um, again, it gets expensive, but I know that this person is going to get to the range and one of those is going to shoot better than the other. He's going to shoot his box of 20. He's going to go back to that retailer and it's probably going to be sold out. And then you're like, well, I guess I'll just shoot this other stuff. But it all does not shoot the same. So when I buy something, I buy enough of them to where when I do figure out what's working best, uh, that's what I'm going to continue to shoot and make sure you have enough for the upcoming hunt. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. But again, accuracy is everything. Once you're accurate, once you're comfortable, uh, again, personal advice, go a little heavier, but, but accuracy is everything. Nate, what's your recommendation on how much ammo someone should carry with them out in the field? You know, this is one of those questions that probably gets asked a lot. Um, I am on the overkill side. I, I had this conversation actually with a gentleman the other day, and he was a, a very experienced hunter. He's a hunter that has hunted, you know, for 40 years. He, he's guided in Alaska, uh, and he's that person that carries like five cartridges with him. He's like, I only need one, so I have four extras. Um, let's face it, things go wrong. Things happen. Uh, you know, again, it's hunting. Ideally, and in every situation, I truly hope for everybody out there, you make one shot, the animal goes down immediately, you have a clean harvest, and it is what it is. Um, in regards to that, I very rarely need a lot of ammo, but I still carry it. I would say that, generally speaking, uh, I'm always going to carry in one pocket enough to fill my, my rifle. So, generally speaking, most of my rifles are going to hold four cartridges. Uh, I will then put one of those in the chain. So my rifle in a hunting situation is almost always going to be four. I then carry a sleeve on the side of my firearm that holds nine. So all my firearms, I have a kind of right on my butt stock. I have an ammunition carrier right there. Those almost always hold nine. So I have four, you know, considered in the rifle. I actually don't load until I shoot. So even when I'm in the woods, I keep everything in the magazine and literally until I am seconds from taking the shot, I then load one into the chamber. Uh, so four in the rifle. I have nine on the buttstock and I always carry two in my pack. So this is my pack right here in my lower pocket. I always have two spares. Uh, so that's going to put me, I believe, at 17. So four in the rifle, nine on the buttstock, two very extreme emergency rounds uh, in a pocket. And that's what I carry. It's heavy. I don't want to carry that much, but I owe it to the animal that I am chasing uh, to do my part in conservation, my part as, as an active hunter, uh, and make sure that we don't have situations uh, of wounded game or non-recovered game uh, due to your failure of having enough ammunition. So uh, at the end of the day, always carry a little more than you need. Uh, hopefully you never need it. It's like one of those situations. If you have it, you don't need it. But when you don't have it, that's when you do need those things. So carry more than less. Uh, it's worth the extra weight. So I'm excited about the next question because it's one I've always been nervous to ask you. So I'm glad somebody's asking it. So how much time should someone give it after the first shot and the animal goes down before they approach it? Absolutely. So this is one of those situations that... You, know, you you take the shot, whether this is archery, muzzleloader, rifle, um, you are doing everything in your power to hopefully understand where that animal is hit. Um, you, know, you take that shot, hopefully in your rifle, uh, you're going to watch point of contact. So hopefully you watch where that bullet hits, where you have a good idea in your head, hey, that was a, a flawless shot, that was not a great shot. Uh, same archery, muzzleloader, you hope uh, that you see point of contact. Muzzleloader is probably the hardest just due to the smoke. Uh, but you you hope number one to see that that's gonna give me an idea of what that is two you are immediately acting uh, upon how the animal reacts after the shot does it immediately drop does it hunch um, does it run away very fast does it pause um, all of these are gonna be indications of how that animal is hit in a true great shot so what we're gonna consider a double lung shot I don't care what the, the method of take is uh, rifle archery muzzleloader when I am shooting it right behind the shoulder I am penetrating both lungs uh, it is a great shot on that animal let's just say that that animal disappears out of sight uh, I give that animal at least one hour so generally speaking it is one hour uh, upon shot assuming I cannot see that animal um, so that's it one hour now the the biggest thing here I want to see the animal either fall or I want to see it run away as terrified and crazy as possible because those are both signs a fall or a very aggressive uh, dart away are great signs of a great shot if i take a shot and the animal hunches so if you see a back hunch 
to where the animal of any species, doesn't matter if it's pronghorn, elk, bear, deer, if you see a hunch, uh, that's going to be more that liver shot, so it's going to be a little bit too far back. So the hunch is an immediate reaction to a liver shot. Uh, that liver shot is going to be more of a four-hour recovery. Sometimes it can be immediate, uh, but generally speaking, talking hours, because that's what this question is, a liver shot, I'm going to do four hours. So uh, generally speaking, they hunch and they do a slow walk. Um, a lot of times I'm going to try to immediately, you know, take a second shot on the animal, whether it's archery, muzzler, or rifle. Um, I, if the animal is within sight and, and I can take a shot, I am immediately shooting again. Um, this is one of those things that I actually, I hate to say it, but it was a cameraman, uh, not you, Tim, um, but it was a camera person that I was working with that I shot a bull perfectly, uh, and the bull fell, uh, and it was laying there. I mean, it was pretty much done, but, but I could see that the animal, you know, was not out yet. Uh, we still had some, some breathing going on. So I shot it again. He's like, man, what are you doing? He's laying down. And, Again, we owe it to that animal to, to make the cleanest harvest possible. So if I can see the animal and I can tell that it is not uh, in a harvestable state yet, I, I continue shooting. Um, again, it's one of those things that we owe it to that animal. So keep that in mind. Uh, I don't care how good your shot was. If the animal's still standing, you can still see it. Take that other shot. You're shooting it behind the lungs. You're hitting ribs. There's a minor piece of rib meat that you're losing. Uh, so you're not hurting the cape because you're, you're, all your taxidermy stuff uh, is above that. You're not hurting the meat because that's above that. Uh, when you're in a double lung situation, <clears throat> you're not wasting anything by taking multiple shots. So, so keep shooting until that animal's down. Uh, but shoot it. It runs away fast. Great shot. One hour. You shoot it, it hunches up with a situation like a liver, four hours. If you hit it what we what we call a, a gut shot, or you hit it you know far back, so you are halfway between the front shoulder and the rear shoulder, um, a lot of times those are going to take, you know, even to a situation where it's a 12-hour recovery overnight type situation. Uh, so I shoot, the animal leaves. Um, I'm going to give it one hour before I even approach the area. When I approach the area, I do not go anywhere near where the animal went. I'm going to then find where the shot was at, <clears throat> and I'm going to look for, for a blood trail. Upon that, I'm looking at the blood. If I have dark blood, I'm, I'm again, liver, it's going to shortening up that, that tracking time. Uh, if I am very light blood, but no bubbles, uh, even the situation of smelling it, if you can smell uh, kind of a little bit more of that intestinal smell, um, again, I'm going to be looking at a much longer recovery rate. The biggest thing is, or the worst thing to do is to push the animals. Uh, even in a terrible shot, they are going to go and they are going to bed down. If they are uninterrupted, they are, are going to you know pass away in that first bed. Uh, you're going to recover that animal upon you know tracking that animal down. If you do not give enough time and you push the animal out of their bed, it gives them a burst of energy like nothing else. Uh, and once you push them out of your bed, your recovery odds drastically go down. So give them the time that they need upon that recovery. Uh, and then the last question is there. Like, hey, I shot it. It fell, it's laying there. How long do I wait? <clears throat> I watch it extremely close with my optics. Uh, so whether that's through my rifle scope, whether that is through a spotting scope or with my binoculars, um, I am staring very much at their eyelids. Are they blinking? I am very much staring at the, the highest point of their rib cage. Are they breathing? Uh, between the animal blinking and or the rib cage moving upon breath, those are the things that I am looking for. If I can stare at that animal for 10, 15 minutes, uh, looking very close, looking at the eyelids, uh, looking at that top point of, those, of, the, of the rib cage, if there is minimal movement, I will then move closer. Not walking to the animal, I will move closer. You know, get to where you're 20 yards, stare at the eye again, stare at the ribs. Uh, upon no movement, then you're, then you're good to approach that animal. Uh, but again, just we owe it to that animal to, to have that respect. Yeah, thanks. That's great information and great indicators for hunters to watch for when they're out in the field. So switching gears on you a bit, yep. um, talking more about gear. Um, what type of scope are you using? And is there something that's a little bit more budget friendly than um, everybody's famous name, Swarovski? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it, it, honestly, it is such a great time to, to be purchasing optics. Had this question uh, came up six, seven years ago, it was tough. You did not get 
the availability of good glass with budget. You also do not get power with budget. And those are kind of two different things. Uh, but regardless, in this day and age, absolutely, there are some great optics out there. Uh, you know, I hate to just push certain brands. Uh, most of your, your brands out there are going to offer an entry-level optic. Um, with that being said, here's the things that I consider. Number one, I want to take in as much light as possible. So I am trying to set a budget, whether it's $200, $400, or whatever the case may be, the tube on my rifle scope, I am looking for the largest tube possible. Your smallest tubes are going to be one inch. You then go to like a 30 millimeter tube, and then you step up to a 34 millimeter tube. Uh, so the tube of that optic, I like to be big. I want my objective, the bell on the front of that, uh, to be a larger objective. I want to take in as much light as possible. So taking in light is probably one of my major priorities when purchasing optics. So taking in light is huge. I also want as much versatility and power power as possible. Uh, my first 10 rifle scopes were three by nine. And then we came up with like three by 12 and we were like, holy cow, I can zoom into 12. I can see everything. Uh, nowadays, I would say most manufacturers are going to offer an optic somewhere around a four by 15 or a five by 25. Those are the optics that I'm using. Um, even on five power, I can still take a close range shot at 50 yards you know, 70 yards. So it's not overpowering on your close shots, but at a 200 yard shot or 100 yard shot, your capabilities, when you can crank in that power, it is a lot harder to miss when you can zoom in. That's the biggest thing that I tell people. Uh, you know, when you're on a range, it's one thing. You're calm, you're steady, you're on bags, but when you've hiked up a hill, you know, the, the animal of a lifetime standing there, you're you're excited everything is pumping um and all of a sudden the shakes come in when i am on a three by nine optic so a three by nine by 40 fay um i can shake and i can come on and off my my prime zone for my shot placement and it gets tough when i can zoom into 25 power even when i'm shaking i'm still on that that zone at which i want to hit so buying an optic with more power uh, is going to be an awesome situation so look for an optic with light uh, look for an op op again an optic that has a lot of power um, i know that i actually i have a pile of sitting right here i'm just looking at one of my in my corner of my room i'm just about to put it on on a rifle this week uh, but i literally am spending 220 dollars uh, and i am getting glass that's going to be a five by 25 by 50 uh, that is absolutely unbelievable so there is options on a budget uh, you can private message me i can give you a few more details but but there are a lot of options out there and you definitely do not have to spend uh, the ultimate money i do put, invest in some good rings uh, good bases put loctite on everything uh, that's one of the biggest things so make sure you mount it correctly use loctite because um, if you do have, you know, again, on a lesser budget, uh, that's when things can go wrong. If things are not tight, that's when the, the rattle of the recoil can hurt uh, the more budget-friendly optics. So, again, make sure you mount them right, lock tight them, get everything squared up and perfect, and you'll have a great time with those, those budget optics. So I was happy to hear you mention that shake that everybody experiences while looking through their scope. I thought I was one of the few people that experienced that. So um, great question that came in earlier is, do you think a shooting stick is a good option for kids, for adults? And I know there's a single stick and then there's also some tripod options. So if you could talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. So so in regards to shooting, especially shooting sticks, uh, you have a monopod, you have a traditional you know, bipod, and then obviously you have the, the, the triples. Um, in regards to that, breaking those down. Number one, I highly suggest a, a bipod uh, or a shooting stick that is two sticks. A single monopod allows you too much moving around uh, and it will cost you some shots out there. So number one, make sure you're getting a shooting stick. If you have something that has two legs, uh, that's going to be awesome. Uh, so that's my number one goal. Three is even better. The problem is when you start shooting on a lot of slopes, Putting up a, a three-legged tripod style shooting stick takes a lot of time, makes a lot of noise, uh, and it's not easily you know moved around. As for if you just have the traditional two legs, um, you know, if you're all of a sudden the animal moves, it's easy to pick them up, slide them down the hill, and adjust, pick them up to gain height. Uh, so it's a lot faster to shoot a two-legged pod. So that's what I am always going to suggest. Now the biggest thing there is I train with this. So I go, I shoot, um, and I know exactly my distance and my capabilities with everything. So I can tell you right now, offhand, 
that I, I don't care what I'm hunting, I don't care what rifle I'm shooting, if I am offhand, I am within 50 yards. And that is pushing it. Uh, 50 yards is my hard stop without any sort of rest. And then upon a shooting stick, I know that if I sit down, if I can be flat on the ground where my butt is on the ground, uh, I can extend out to, to another range. Um, I know that upon leaning against a tree with a stick, it extends my range a little further. Uh, so I know exactly Exactly my distances of all shooting situations. So when I shoot, I try to go to a range that allows me to shoot from the bench, allows me to shoot from my shooting sticks, allows me to lay down, allows me to shoot off my bag, um, allows me to shoot off the post at that shooting center. Um, and I practice all of those and I know my distances to all. I can tell you right now that no matter what I'm doing, if I'm, you know, kneeling, shooting sticks, if I am anything but actually laying down, my distance is fairly short. If I can lay down, uh, I have the same situation. I will carry a very large pack. I actually pack my gear to where I have a rest right here. So you can see I have a high point, a high point. My rifle sits right here on this pack. I would say that I try to take 95% of my shots laying down on this pack. If I can lay down on that pack, my accuracy is through the roof. So it helps me out. And I encourage everybody to learn what you're good at because that's when things go bad. If you strictly practice shooting on sticks on your butt and all of a sudden you get in the woods and your elevation's wrong and you're a little high, a little low, that's when things fall apart. So I know exactly how I shoot, the distance that I can shoot, and that's in my head as I approach. So when all of a sudden I see my target, so it's an elk, a deer, a bear, a pronghorn, I'm ranging it. As I hike literally through the woods, I am looking for where I'm going to set up that shot. So even if I don't see an animal, if I'm hiking up the hill, I tell myself, that animal approach right now, if all of a sudden one steps out, where am I shooting from? So as I walk through the woods, I walk to where I'm next to a rock. I walk to where I'm next to a tree, to where I am planning that shot. And that's one of those things that comes with experience, but I encourage that. Shoot a lot, figure out the positions that you're comfortable with, and as you walk through the woods, in your head, have that be a, one of those little mindsets where you're like, hey, if all of a sudden happened right now, where do I go? Because the more you are trained, the more you're ready for it, the more success you'll have and the accuracy that you'll have upon that shot. So keep all of those in your head, uh, but practice it. And you know, we just talked uh, about that. My wife can shoot flawlessly from sticks. I can shoot half of her distance. It's just who I am and everybody's different. I know people that are more accurate from sticks than they are laying down. Shoot all the positions, build confidence, but most importantly, have a number in your head of your distance that you can shoot from that position and keep to it and stick to it. You have to be honest with yourself. You're in the woods, you say, hey, I can only shoot 100 yards from this position, and if that animal steps up and it's at 150, again, priorities are on the animal. Tell yourself, I know I can't make that shot, I need to move, I need to get closer, I need to change positions, uh, but have that in your head because that's gonna help you out in achieving a more successful hunt. So before I ask you questions about your pack and all the yeah. goodies that you carry in it, I want to hit a topic that we haven't had a whole lot of time to talk about over the last couple series, and that's about what to wear. Yeah. Um, so questions about should you wear camo? Is camo necessary? And then, of course, there's the scent blocking clothing, laundry, spray, all of that. So if you could tie all of those topics into, <laughs> into a good answer. So in regards to camo, we'll start with that one. Um, it's one of those touch and go situations. So animals are gonna pick up scent the first. So I know we're gonna talk about scent clothing here in a second, but scent is number one, movement is number two, true visibility of you. If they can't smell you and they don't see you moving, I hate to say it, uh, camel is probably not one of those required things. Um, every camel manufacturer out there gets mad at me when I say this type of stuff um, because I don't necessarily think that camel is necessary. The reason for it, I have called in more bulls wearing my blaze orange vest and hat during muzzleloader season uh, than I have during archery season. So I have been in the most neon apparel out there. And again, in Colorado, you cannot wear camel orange. Keep that in mind. You have to have blaze orange, blaze hat, uh, blaze orange or pink, uh, but hat and vest uh, has to be blaze, one solid color, no camo, you can't break it up. Um, but I've had as much success being undetected in that uh, as much as I do camo. 
Um, now, I will say, I do think that you have better availability of clothing in camo. So I think you have quieter materials. I think you have better moisture wicking materials. I think you have warmer materials. Uh, so I think the technology in hunting clothing, in particular camo, is far better. So I can tell you that I wear camo strictly for the fact that I have better maneuverability. I can hike better in my camo than I can my traditional hiking pants. I know that I have a lot lighter weight down coat in camo series than I do the traditional puffy that I would wear in a general outdoor setting. So I do support the camo industry strictly for the fact that I think the apparel is better made and it's suited for hunters. Um, but as far as the true visibility, uh, they're going to smell you first, they're going to see you move second. So as long as you're not getting smelled, and as long as you don't move around, draw the bow, move the binos, everything that everybody does, you know, the best is like, where? I don't say, where? I'm like, you can still look without moving your head. Um, the, the, the movement and the smell is what kills you. So if you can stay, you know, still and you don't get smelled, I don't understand any camels thing. But again, I do think you, you want to make sure that you're not sweating. You're not, you know, you don't want to be wet and cold. You definitely don't want that clothing where you walk by a bush like swish, 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 swish. Um, so, so that's the priority. And that's where you do find uh, the better materials and the better quality stuff in camels. So keep that in mind. As far as, you know, scent proof, things like that. Um, I think that the scent proof clothing is the greatest invention of all time uh, and all those brands. I think it's the greatest thing ever. Now, with that being said, I think you get to put it on and you have to sit like this. So in regards to when I go on whitetail hunts, when I sit in a pronghorn blind, um, when I do hunts where I have minimal movement, I try to wear that stuff. I try to, even if I don't wear scent eliminating clothing, I will try to spray myself down with a, an eliminating spray. But I would say on 95% of the hunts I go on, I am hiking around enough, whether it's hiking in, hiking out, actively hiking on my stock. Um, I am hiking around enough where I have enough sweat coming off my eyes. Even if I was in full scent lock clothing, um, I have enough scent coming off my face or my hands. Um, to, it's enough to ruin the hunt. So I would say it is not a priority. My priority is playing the wind. So hands down, I would try to scout your thermals, have a wind detector with you at all times. I would put far more priority in playing the wind than I would investing in those clothing. Uh, it's one of those things. But again, if you know you have a hunt coming up where you're sitting in a tree stand, we're in a ground blind, um, that's where the clothing would excel and do well because you're not moving, you're not sweating, uh, you're in a very controlled environment, and it's nice. Uh, but I would say that most of the Colorado hunting experience uh, is going to require enough effort um, to where this scent eliminating clothing type gear uh, is not going to be as as valuable uh, and playing the wind is going to be much more valuable uh, so again scouting every morning I go out there I watch where my thermals change uh, I keep track of all of that I really tie it to the day so I say hey average sunny day my thermal switch here hey average cloudy day my thermal switch here average day when a storm is approaching my thermal switch here uh, I put a major influence on understanding the wind uh, and making the most of it uh, I also scout the wind with trail cameras we talked about this in a, in a feed earlier uh, but just to kind of reiterate it for everybody out there that's doing digital scouting especially if you're starting to set trail cameras um, I take a long string very very soft I find the lightest material I can possibly find fluff it up, and I hang it from a tree in front of my tail camera 10, 15 feet out. Every time I have a picture, um, whether you know it's an elk coming in, a bear, a deer, a prong, or whatever the case may be, I always have a slight light string, you can have a feather, uh, to where hopefully that that string or that indicator, uh, ribbon, anything, will be moving one way or the other. So upon a picture, I now say, hey, that animal approached from right to left, from north to south, whatever. I know which way the animal was coming from. I know the time it was there because it's time stamped on that camera. I then have my wind indicator showing the wind. So now I have everything. I know where they came from. I know where they're going. I know what time they were there. And most importantly, I know what the wind was doing. So I know how I approach and how I set up on that spot. Uh, so again, I put more influence on the wind uh, than I do the clothing for sure. Great. Thanks, Nate. I want to lead us back to talking about choosing the right pack. Okay. 
um, what you should put in it and about how heavy should it be? <laughs> That's the biggest question I think that we've got, especially in the last week or so. A lot of people saw my big heavy pack in one of the videos and we probably had 20 questions upon that. Just, man, it's a huge pack. What do you carry in there? Uh, it's very situational. So uh, in regards to that, number one, I, I look at the situation where I'm hunting. Is this a thing where I am hiking in miles? You know, I'm doing a three, five, seven mile hike. When I do a longer extended hunt where I am going far back, um, obviously I'm going to bring enough clothing to wear anything happens. If I have a weather change, I'm prepared for it. If I have a situation where I hurt myself, I want to make sure that I can, again, protect myself, stay warm, stay dry, have food, all of those type things. So if it is a very short hunt, um, you know, again, I, I know we can't plan everything, but I am very intentional uh, on a very quick short hunt. I will have a lighter pack. Anytime I'm going further, I'm going to have a bigger pack. Um, so I really tie it into that number one, as far as how big the pack is or how much gear you carry. Um, I always carry enough stuff to where I can stay in the woods. I can tell you right now, uh, guiding big game hunts for 10 years, uh, generally speaking, hunting very on a professional level for 20 years, um, rarely do I ever stay in the woods overnight unexpected. Now, I do a lot of pack trips, but very rarely do I end up just staying for no reason. But I always carry my water filter to where if I run out of water, I can stay longer. I always carry enough food source, whether that's bars or you know pre-made like little protein balls or protein packs. Um, I always carry enough food for whatever my hunt is plus one day. So if I'm hunting for one day, I carry enough snacks and food for two days. Um, so I always carry enough gear to where I can stay in the woods a little bit longer and make sure that I stay safe. Um, I always carry rain gear. There is some unbelievable rain gear out there. We we're talking about Camel a minute ago. Uh, there's some great companies making ultralight rain gear to where literally it can fit in a pocket. It, you know, folds up into a pouch, but I carry rain gear almost on every day, whether it's supposed to rain or not, because again, being wet leads to cold and it leads to dangerous situations. So I lead to staying dry. Um, but I do carry a bigger pack because, you know, I mean, I'm carrying my optic everywhere. So I'm carrying a larger tripod. I am carrying my larger spotting scope. Um, this is one of those things that I actually had an argument with a lot of my hunting friends because they're like, why do you carry a spotting scope? We know we're going to be close to the animals. So you can just use your binos. I carry a spotting scope everywhere because it drives me crazy when I'm in and all of a sudden I see that animal a mile away. And I can't tell what it is. I, I have to know. It's just one of those things inside me. So I carry a spotting scope everywhere. I carry a lot of gear. Um, I also get used to carrying a larger pack because when I hunt, I carry a larger pack. I always make sure that I can take one load out upon harvest. So whether I am bear hunting, deer hunting, elk hunting, upon harvest, so whether I'm, you know, couple hundred yards in the woods or five miles in, uh, upon harvest, I always take one load out with me. I usually always take a quarter out with me. Uh, so in my day pack, I can always take a quarter of the meat out with me to where uh, I start that pack out process. Um, I love hunting with a lighter pack. I love having a lightweight pack, but upon harvest, a lot of times I have to go back immediately, get a pack trim or get a larger pack and go back in. I like to carry a pack large enough uh, to where I can take one piece of meat out on, on the initial harvest. It just helps me uh, get that animal out of the woods quicker, gets me to the processor faster, and really just takes care of my meat. My meat is absolutely my priority. I live on it. It's everything. I definitely do not want to have wasted animal, wasted game, or anything like that. So meat's priority. I have a large enough pack to take that out. I can tell you right now with my survival gear, so this is some food. It's my little water filter, my camo uh, rain suit. I carry a puffy jacket at all times. Uh, it's lightweight. It'll always keep you warm. Tripod, spotting scope. I have a huge three liter water bladder. Uh, long story short, I overpack. My pack weighs 53 pounds. Um, I know that exact number because I literally, every hunting season, for 20 years, I repack it probably two to three times during the hunting season. And, you know, sometimes I'll be like, all right, I can take out my chapstick. But even though I tell myself I can lighten it up, at the end of the day, you know, I carry some camera equipment, uh, everything that I carry. I carry trekking poles with me so when I get, do harvest. On a daily hunt, I don't use my trekking poles. Upon harvest, and I am putting a you know, 50, 60, 80 pound quarter in my bag, I use my trekking poles to make sure I don't hurt my ankles or my knees on the way out. So I have my, my very gear there. Uh, and actually, we had enough questions. We'll probably host a live feed or at least an edited piece of content coming up where I break down the pack and I talk about everything I carry 
carry and more so why I carry it just so it can kind of spark that decision and say, hey, in my situation, I don't need that. Or hey, in my situation, I might need that. So look for a live feed on, on gear and in that and pack uh, coming probably pretty shortly or at least an edited piece of content for you. Uh, but again, my pack does weigh 53 pounds. It's overkill. It's large, but I am ready for every situation uh, and I'm especially ready to take out meat upon harvest. Nate, I'm always amazed at how quickly an hour goes and how much information you're able to share with everybody. But I do want to hit on two topics before we start to wrap up. Um, one of those being leftover day is coming up. Um, can you give people some advice on navigating that? And then also had a question about is an over-the-counter tag worth it? Absolutely. So, so number one, uh, leftover day. This is one of those situations that every year uh, there are a lot of licenses and there are a lot of great licenses. I talk to a lot of hunters that overlook the leftover licenses going on sale. Uh, so they're going to go on sale August third at nine a.m. Um, so many hunters are like, ah, oh, it's leftover. There's nothing good on that. Things happen. Uh, you know, hunters turn in their licenses due to health or fires or whatever. Licenses, you know, become available that weren't available before. Um, quotas change, whatever. Things happen and licenses become available on that leftover list. Uh, so when that becomes available, I would definitely scan it over. Whether you plan on purchasing licenses or not, uh, I would scan over when that comes out. Uh, again, it'll be available early August. Uh, make sure you look at that list because it'll always shock you some things there. There. As far as how to obtain one of those licenses, there's a lot of available ways to do that. The, the Probably the biggest two is going to any licensed agent. So, I mean, you can go to any of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife offices, and then obviously there are a ton of retailers. There's gas stations, there's grocery stores. Um, there's a million different people that sell those licenses. Um, so, so making sure that you have a plan to do that. With that, I don't just show up. They're going to go on sale at 9 a.m. If you are in an area that is, you know, not not known to have license sales, uh, not a very populated area, you can, might be able to walk in at you know 8.55 and purchase that license. The more popular areas, you know, your Colorado Personal Life offices, your big retailers, um, they'll even have a line of, of people that might wait in line to purchase those licenses. I do ask them, so I would call your retailer, call Colorado Personal Life and say, hey, I plan on trying to purchase a license uh, on August 3rd. How do I do this? They're going to say, hey, this is great. We actually have a plan. You know, stop by that morning. We're going to give you a number. That way you're not waiting in line and, you know, creating hazards or <clears throat> they will navigate you how that day is going to go at that particular license agent. So I plan ahead of time. I know where I'm going to go. I call them and say, hey, do you plan on having a line? If so, how, how do we navigate this line? What's best for you? What's best to you know not make it a, a busy day? Um, so I have a plan set forth. Uh, so upon a physical purchase at one of those licenses, just have a plan. As far as other ways, everything goes available online as well. So you can literally be on your phone and you have the same odds as going to that retailer. I think so many people think to themselves, I have to go to a physical office, my odds are better. Um, Honestly, it's all going through the same system. So you can navigate it through your phone, your computer, uh, a tablet. You can go in to purchase that. There's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, nobody's really having better odds or that than others. Uh, I mean, maybe if you're a real slow typer, maybe go into a physical office. Maybe if you haven't worked the uh, the car Parks and Wildlife system. Uh, yeah, I mean, when you go in, you're going to select your residency. You're going to have to approve all your information. You're going to have to say, that, hey, I haven't had an address change. You know, maybe you don't have your credit card logged in. Um, so there's a lot that goes through that. So if I go to a retailer, contact that retailer for an in-licensed in purchase. Uh, make sure you have a plan how they're going to you know, interact with you on that day and have a plan and go forth. If you're going to do it on your phone, I always go online first. Check my account. I make sure my credit card is up to date. I make sure that my address is correct. Make sure all your spelling is right. So you can go online, check your account. Everything's on there. So just like click on account, log in, make sure you know your password, uh, make sure you have all that information current, make sure it's good, and that's going to help you uh, make that a lot smoother process on that day. So keep that in mind. And as far as over the counter, we have the best available over-the-counter licenses of anywhere in the country. I will argue with everybody. I talk to a lot of people that <coughs> say, oh, Idaho or Montana, these places have great tags. Uh, with our, especially in our elk situation of having over the license uh, or over-the-counter licenses for, for pronghorn, arch, arch, or, me, pronghorn through archery options, 
all of your elk options through archery and second and third rifle, uh, you know, some bear opportunities. There are some great things with over the counter and there are a lot of units that you can use and I hunt over the counter on a lot of different tags. Uh, so it is definitely worth it. I will say that that's where scouting comes into play. Obviously the over the counter stuff, they do that because there are huge herd counts. A lot of people say, oh, it's an over the counter license. That's a terrible unit. The reason that those are available for over-the-counter over the uh, license sales is because the herd counts are strong. Uh, find those units. Scout them. Uh, find the areas that hunters are not utilizing. Find the areas that general recreation are not using. Uh, you can find some hidden gems in a lot of our OTC stuff here in Colorado. So definitely, if you did not get a tag in the primary draw, the secondary draw, maybe in the coming weeks you don't see anything on the leftover list that you want, I promise you the over-the-counter stuff is worth checking out. Make sure you look at it. You still have time to scout. Go back. Watch the playlist on YouTube. Watch our entire scouting process. Implement it in one of those units, and you can definitely achieve success. So one last question for you, Nate. How should we um, go about finding a meat processor in our area? This Ho is hoping for success. <laughs> so... Wanting a good meat processor. Absolutely. You, you definitely want to be prepared for this. Uh, this is one of those things that we always talk about planning ahead um, because there's so much that goes into this. Now, generally speaking, we're going to say pre-2020. Um, not that anything happened that year, but just pre-2020, There, honestly, there was a lot of processors available and out there. Um, the one thing that changed in 2020, obviously, through some regulation changes, a lot of your large processors more in the beef side of things. So your commercial beef processors um, had to reduce their production uh, due to regulations set forth with how they can run employees and staffing and how close you could be. And with that, there was a bigger supply and demand for processing beef. And a lot of the processors that used to process wild game switched over, uh, had to you know go by all the regulations you know, through FDA and all this to process beef and no longer were processing wild game. So last year, year, uh, we saw a, a fairly large decrease in availability of big game processors. Um, and it was one of those things that hunters didn't check into this. They they created their harvest, they called their normal processor, hey, I'm coming in, and they found out the bad news of, hey, you know, we're no longer processing wild game. Or the ones that they are doing are now busier to, to kind of compensate for that. Um, so we encourage everybody right now, call your local processor. Number one, make sure they're open. Ask them, hey, upon harvest, do I come in immediately? Do you accept quarters or is the animal have to be whole? Do you accept deboned meat? You know, let's just say I am a backcountry hunter. I, I, I can't even pack out the bone. I'm gonna, you know, debone that animal in the field. At what point in time do you take boneless meat? All the processors are gonna have a time date of how they do this. They might say, hey, absolutely upon kill, come immediately, or they might say, hey, you know, you have time to you know freeze it and then thaw it and bring it in. However, that process goes. Call it, Google it right now, search big game processors, contact one in your area, one that you want to go to, one that does the cuts of meat that you like, and have that conversation right now. Or read their website and just figure out what you need to do, your obligation as a hunter to that processor, and how that how that basically process is going to go. When do you show up? How do you show up? And most importantly, how that animal needs to show up. You want to make sure that when you bring this in, that animal is clean. And we always bring in the process and the option of skinning that animal. Uh, we see a lot of hunters that will look at their processor and they'll say, hey, look, my processor will skin the animal for 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 200 bucks. That's a good deal. Let's not skin it in the woods because they'll do it for us. Um, so you see a lot of hunters, especially if they harvest an animal that is close to an access point for a vehicle or, or packing out, and they might just gut that animal and might leave the hide on. Their concept in their head is like, hey, now it won't get dirty because the hide's on. We'll just have our processor do that. The problem is that hide holds heat in and you drastically increase uh, the availability of getting rot in that meat or losing that meat <coughs> due to the fact that the animal not cooling down fast enough. Uh, so in regards to that, in all situations, my personal advice, I skin that animal immediately upon harvest. Uh, it immediately cools down and it increases the quality of that meat. The faster that meat cools off, the better quality it's going to be, the more it's going to degas, uh, and the better it's going to taste 
on your table. Uh, so I highly, highly encourage immediately upon harvest, uh, you walk up to that animal, before you take a picture, tag the animal. Say that right now. Uh, again, you're keeping evidence of sex on that animal. Uh, so make sure you read it. It's in the big game brochure. Check out what you do as far as licensing. But again, endorse it. Sign that tag. Use a knife, not just a pin. Cut out and notch. Evidence of sex. The date. Everything that you need to do upon that. Um, so make sure you mark your tag correctly. Attach that tag to the animal. And then get to skinning. Um, so again, I skin everything. But again, have a contact with that processor. Have that conversation. Ask how they want it. But the biggest thing that you're going to encounter is these guys saying, Hey, just FYI, we will skin your animal. But if that animal is rotten, they usually cannot accept it. So keep that in mind. That's one of the biggest things I heard from all the processors locally uh, last year. Keep that in mind. Uh, a skinless animal is going to cool it off and it's going to be a lot better for everyone. Processor, you, uh, and everybody involved in that process. Thanks, Nate. I think game care is one of those things that people are most unsure of, yep. um, but it's very critical. So hopefully we get to do an engagement in the future and talk about Definitely. that more. I will say we are working on that right now to, to do something uh, to just show you that process because it can. I think a lot of us even watch videos, but all of a sudden we have an animal in front of us. It's bigger. It's heavier. Uh, it's awkward. Everything about it is different. Make sure you have a plan in play uh, and just to make sure that you are ready to handle that because, again, it's a major priority. And, again, in these future videos, we're going to talk about game bags. You know, how long do you let it air out before you put it in your pack? How do you cut it up? What are all those steps? I know we have a lot of stuff still to come. We encourage everybody, if tonight's your first night watching this, go back, jump on YouTube, watch our playlist. We have edited content. We have other live feeds. We had a lot of questions, comments, things like that. So watch all the things we've done, and I promise you, keep an eye out for the future. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. We have stuff about gear, about packs, about processing. And one of the coolest things I'm excited about, we're going to be talking to, to people in the field. We're going to be talking to wildlife officers just prior to the start of a lot of these big game seasons to give you real-time information. So right before archery pronghorn, right before the archery combined deer and elk season, we're going to give you updates at what your animals might be doing, where they are in the rut, uh, and a lot of information. It's going to be final steps, last-minute information. These are literally going to be like valuable little nuggets of gold of what your animals might be doing to help you achieve more success. So again, we have a lot of stuff stored. Make sure you check it out. We also have a lot of stuff that Brian's been working on on his Learn to Hunt series. That's all available on YouTube. You can follow that on Instagram as well as on the Facebook pages. Uh, so a lot of other you know hunters like me doing the same type stuff. So a ton of information. Get caught up on it. It makes great material to learn from and keep an eye out for the future because we got a lot of stuff to come. And most importantly, thank you so much for watching. Again, I was your host tonight, Nate Zielinski. This is the Big Game Hunting Series, uh, you know, brought to you by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Stay tuned, and thank you so much for watching. Share this right now. If you still have questions, comment below. We'll get to them. Uh, but let's everybody have a great, successful, safe hunting season.